MSDC. Good afternoon, NMSDC family. My name is Von Che Jenkins, and I do have the pleasure of leading supplier diversity and responsible sourcing for Bank of America. But today, I'm most excited to be your moderator for what many will consider a dynamic business discussion. Welcome to Straight Talk with the Titans of Business. We've assembled for you industry leaders from Bank of America, BMW, and Caesars Entertainment, who will share with you of the moment insight into the current business environment and what you should be thinking about as you operate your businesses. Ways to focus on your customer and the ever-changing sales process, and what businesses and corporations should be focused on to lead them into the future, which is sustainability and the ever-changing, by-the-minute world of technology. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to welcome Aether Williams, who is the head of business banking for Bank of America. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Craig Westbrook, who is the regional vice president of the Southern Region for BMW. And last, but certainly not least, Gwen Megida, who is the global lead of social impact, equity, and sustainability for Caesars Entertainment. Let's give them a round of applause. So we have a lot uh, to get through, so let's go ahead and get started. Aether, I'm gonna start with you. So your teams speak to and offer products and services to thousands of business owners uh, every year. So you have your pulse on the business environment, what businesses are focused on and what they need to be focused on um, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. So would love to hear your insights there, but before you do, would love to hear from you in your own words what you and your teams deliver for Bank of America every day. Sure, thank you, Vanche. So just to put things into perspective, so Bank of America, we've aligned ourselves around eight lines of business. So we have four that focus on individuals, so think about the consumer bank, preferred and small business, so small business being really those under you know, $5 million in sales. Um, and then our two uh, wealth management businesses, both the private bank and Merrill. From a wholesale banking perspective, we have three businesses focused on companies. So business banking, which is the one I run, global commercial banking, and corporate investment banking. And then we have a, um, the global markets business, which really focus on institutions, so investors. And so we have teams in business banking, about, about 1,200 teammates around the country in about 150 cities, really focusing on helping companies grow and prosper. And so just to put in the context why I'm here and why I think this segment and you all are so important. So if you look at stats from the Small Business Association, which kind of classifies companies of under 500 employees as being a small business. So companies like you employ about 58 million Americans. You created about 66% of the jobs created in the last two decades. So we've been in this economic boom. 66% of the jobs have been created by companies like you. However, the challenge is what we're seeing in the future. So between, if we go back to the financial crisis, from the first quarter of 08 to the fourth quarter of 09, 5.7 million jobs were lost by these same set of companies, which is over 60% of those lost in the entire financial crisis. So while you do lead the way and you're critical for the vitality of the US economy and, and largely for the global economy, you're also the first to suffer when things go sideways. And so it's a real focus for our teammates. So my background, I currently run business banking. I've been doing this for the last two years. Prior to this, I ran our global transaction services business, which is think about cash management for the largest companies in the world uh, across 68 countries. So I spent a lot of time overseas. Uh, I've, been, I've been the CFO of a, of a venture-backed startup, and I started my career as a consultant. So I've been on both sides of the aisle I think about this issue. So when my teammates and I talk to, to, to you all, to business owners, I try to think about it in the context of your journey. 
because the journey you all have is as varied as the companies you run and own. Where are you starting out? Are you at a generational transition? A lot of owners who are owning businesses who survived the last economic crisis are looking at the inflated valuations from private equity these days and saying, is it time to punch out? Should I transition to my children or my siblings or other family members? Those are all questions that myself and my partners in Merrill and the private bank are all helping you all grapple with. Thinking about rapid growth and expansion. There's massive amounts of opportunity, but can you take advantage of it? But these questions, you know, and they're similar in your minds. So you think about, do you have enough customers and capital? Have you thought about how you're gonna finance the growth, the composition of your balance sheet? And you have many more options today than you've had in the past. So what I thought I'd do is just provide you a little bit of context on what we're seeing in the marketplace. So when I think about this evolving landscape, there's a couple of things. So just to deal with the recession question that everyone always asks me. So our economists are forecasting that the US is still in growth mode. It's albeit slower than it had been in the past. 2000, let's put in the context, 2018, US economy grew at about 2.9%. We're forecasting 1.7 for next year. We'll be about 2.3 this year. And it looks similar for most economies. The, Euro, the, Euro, the Eurozone was at about 2% in 18, it's about 1% in 2020. China, 6.6, 6%. And the only one that's really growing continually is India, which was at 6.8 in 2018, and it's going to be at 7% in 2020. What's weighing on all your minds, or what we're hearing from our clients, our network? Brexit, trade wars, central bank actions, be it quantitative easing or rates, where rate levels or negative rates, and then the political risks in gridlock that not only you know, are, are happening in this country, but everywhere else around the world where you have rising nationalism and uncertainty. Those things are creating you know, uncertainty, which really has the impact of affecting business growth, business investment. So business investment from 18 to 19 has dropped down in half by 350 basis points. So it's gone from 7% to 3.5%. And what that does, that has, that has knock-on impacts in the rest of the economy. So while the US consumer is still spending strong, businesses are starting to pull back. And so as we think about the ripple effects of that, that's what's slowing down the economy. It's that uncertainty that we need to get through and can you be, be positive about what's gonna happen. And our network is pretty advanced. So I think about it, we've got 66 million consumer households. We bank three million small businesses. We bank one out of every three mid-market companies. And we bank 5,000 of the largest companies in the world. So we have a pretty good base in which to talk about. So when I give you some feedback from, from that network, this is, what, this is what I'm hearing. So changing expectations, not only just about the global economy, but more importantly about the impact of technology, your ability to invest in it, whether it's in your supply chain or how you manage your financial student ERP, but candidly, the strategic impact of what technology is doing to companies. Because it's not just the advent of social media or, you know, quote unquote, the internet changing your sales channel. It fundamentally changes how you can construct your, your, construct your supply chain. So the consumerization of business. Our users of mobile technology, so business owners, CFOs, <clears throat> wanting to approve payments, manage their business on their phones, We've had 120, 165% growth in subscribers year over year. We're up to half a million, and we've launched it a year ago. First half of this year, business owners have approved almost $250 billion worth of payments on their phones. So the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Other thing under expectations, you're expecting a lot more, and being, more is being expected of you in terms of your role in people's supply chains. So are you a, Partner, or are you a supplier? And it's a very different mentality that's happening, and that's something you need to focus on. Acquiring and retaining talent. With a 3.5% unemployment rate in the United States and gridlock around immigration policy, the number one thing I hear from companies that we bank, and I bank over 30,000 companies between five and $50 million in sales, is the ability to get talented workers, whether it be coders, or welders, there's a dearth of all of them. And the ability to get them to help drive your business forward, it's not that it's not an opportunity, but it's can you find talented people and retain them to go forward. And we're seeing some pretty creative things going on in the marketplace, whether it's really people converting to stock ownership plans, 
people thinking about buying out student debt, people investing heavily with local universities and municipalities around training programs. If you can't find skilled labor, let's build them. I know that's happening here in Georgia. How you manage your working capital. So while I think business owners are opportunistic, or optimistic, I should say, I think that there's a lot of things thinking end to end about your supply chain and thinking about it from a different lens. What's the risk you have to your business of your suppliers? How risky are there? I know you think about the credit risk of your clients. Do you think about the risk of your suppliers, your partners, and your, candidly, your board of directors, who's supporting you? Are you really focused on just the core fundamentals, you know, receivables, payables, inventories, capital, CapEx? One of the big things of this persistently low interest rate environment is you have commercial real estate bubbles in many places in the country. And so thinking about, should you sell your real estate and lease it back? Should you buy? Should you make real estate as an investment? How does real estate play into your wealth transfer from a private banking, personal wealth <coughs> management perspective? All those things are a question given where we see valuations in many markets. And thinking about your balance sheet from a private equity standpoint, private equity is knocking on all your doors every day long. How do you think about what's the right, is that the right money to take? Is that the smart money? It's going to help me grow. Those are all things to kind of consider. And the last thing that's really a hot topic is cybersecurity. So you all are the number one target for fraudsters, for criminals, not only because they wanted to have easier access and you're a lower hurdle, but more importantly, because you are the entryway into larger companies. So if you're in a supply chain of a Bank of America or an AT&T or a BMW, you're a vulnerability point. So can you invest in the amount of cybersecurity and train your employees to look out for schemes and scams? Those are all key things. So planning for succession. I'll hit this one briefly. But thinking about do you have a plan for the future? Not just personally, but for your business. What's your, what's your out? How are you thinking about that, given we're about to go through some uncertain economic times or start to enter into them now? What's that going to do? And to that point, do you have an advisory board? Many of you don't have formal boards of directors, but do you have lawyers, bankers, accountants, who are your, your board you can go to who can tell you no? who can give you true, honest advice and not be on the gravy train with you. But really think about how they help you ensure wealth and transfer over time. Those are all questions that people are asking us, is how can we be that partner? And do you have a proper management team? Do you have a CFO, not a bookkeeper? Do you have a real head of operations? Do you have a real head of sales? People with experience who can help you navigate the difficult times ahead. Those are all questions and things that we hear clients asking us and thinking about. And so lastly, we've been asking our clients this fundamental question, but what would you like the power to do? And really we want to do that to make you really step back and think and spark a dialogue with that advisor group, not just your bank, but everyone, to make sure that your plan for the future is really aligned with the actions you're taking today. So thank you with that. I'll turn it over to my partners to my right. Thank you. Thank you, Aether. Thank Thanks, you. Babe. That's right. I think there's so many nuggets there that we could have picked through, but I really took home succession planning and the external environment and the impact um, on how our businesses operate. Um, but we're going to change the conversation a little bit and talk about the client. And so, Craig, let's turn it over to you. I know that BMW has been on this client-centric uh, journey for a while, as well as your expertise. <laughs> Um, in the sales process. But before you talk to us a little bit about that, tell us what you and your teams deliver for BMW every day. Tell us what? What you and your teams deliver for BMW every day. So what we try to deliver, and I'm actually gonna just, with that question, jump in with, uh, with hopefully uh, an answer. My name's Craig Westbrook, and I'm Vice President uh, with BMW of North America. Uh, and what we are is we are the ultimate driving machine. BMW has been the ultimate driving machine in the United States for 43 years and another 60 in Germany and other parts of the world before that. We are a 100-year-old company in an older industry that is trying very hard to keep up with the changes that Arthur was talking about. What does this mean? Did you know we rely on our products because our products 
are the ultimate products, some of the best in the world. But did you also know that the best products can sometimes be your worst enemy? Why? Because you can rely on them too heavily. If you look out here, if you look at, this, at the floor that we were walking earlier today, there's some automobile manufacturers out there. And guess what? Note to self, there are no real bad cars out there. They're all pretty good. Second note to self, no one really needs a BMW. I hate to say it. <laughs> so big differentiator here is not just the ultimate driving machine, but those customers who might seek a good or as good or maybe, dare I say it, better product somewhere else will have to be captured into the BMW family by the ultimate customer experience. We are and, not or. We have the ultimate driving machine. We are offering the ultimate customer experience to get you in, keep you in, nurture you in, and bring you back. Okay? So how do we do this? <laughs> I'm a titan of business, so I came up with this slide. <laughs> uh, everything is changing. So I'd like to give you, as, as, uh, as we heard earlier, some context for what our business is facing. And of the 3,000 opportunities, I chose three. Okay? Uh, let's just go right into them. Customer visits to dealerships before the purchase of a car. Okay? Back in 2005, you guys went to dealerships five times. <laughs> wow. A lot of time on our hands, right? 2013, that number cut in half, and this past year, it was 1.8, which I tell my dealers, that's 1.0. If you see someone in your showroom, bring them into the family, otherwise they'll go buy somewhere else. Okay, what else? A huge seismic shift from cars, sedans, into sport utility vehicles. We've seen this as a trend in the United States. For BMW, a European manufacturer, it's even bigger. Okay, keep in mind the product life cycle of our car is seven years old. In 2016, two thirds of our vehicles were sedans, typical four door trunk and everything, two thirds. Three years later, that flip flopped. Two thirds of the cars that we sell are SUVs and one third sedans. That is a seismic shift. You can imagine the stress on the supply chain, okay, on the manufacturing production processes, distribution, allocation marketing, sales, customer preference, okay? That shifted fast, and we're still, we're still working on it. Okay, customer loyalty patterns, they're also changing. Look at this one. 93% cross-shopped an automobile manufacturer. 93. I tell my dealers, that's 100. Just round up. It's a stupid number. All of them, okay? They're all cross-shopping you because there's so many good products out there. So we can't just win on the product. We also have to win on the experience. And by the way, 60% switched brands, 60%. We have 50% loyalty, the rest of the world has 40%. Okay, that's pure defection, okay? So what are we gonna do about it? We have to change. And this is, I think, I tried to pick the things that we're working on that I think are probably more universally uh, applicable, and I'd like to talk about four things really briefly <laughs> at kind of a high level on what we're trying to do and to some extent what we've already done. Look at the top left of the screen. That's a car, okay? It's an old analog device that was developed a long time ago and didn't change until you bought your first VCR. And then it started having numbers that would blink on it, right? And now you can FaceTime your kids from the, from the comfort of your own wrist uh, while you're getting your steps in or whatever, okay? This is really about digital transformation, okay? This is about bringing the experience to the customer outside of the dealership in a space that's relevant and meaningful to the customer, okay? So in a short, let's say, to, to, to summarize, go digital and go big. We're an analog industry trying to go digital. Some of you guys are already digital because you grew up there, okay? We're trying to, we're trying to incorporate that, right? A seven-year product with a, with a seven-year life cycle, right, with an iPhone that gets updated over the air every four weeks, that's tough, okay? So we're trying there. That's how we have to reach our customers that's what's also meaningful to them. So my first message is go digital and go big, okay? That's how we reach our customers and keep them in the family. Item two is product, okay? The bottom right of the screen, I hope you can see it. That is a cup holder from a 2010 5 Series. It would swivel out of the, out of the dashboard in front of you and, and cradle the bottom one-tenth of your coffee cup. Because a German guy says, we, we do not drive the cars while we drink the coffee. And I said, but, but Americans do. 
<laughs> and they want a cup holder. And so this is what we got. And it was universally criticized for being a sellout and you know, a tick in the box, here's your cup holder. Because it was a $65,000 car guaranteed to spill your coffee. <laughs> so what did we do is we listened to customers. And we, now if you saw our X7 out there on the floor, top down, they're heated and cooled. German over engineering, proud of it, but they're, they're <laughs> also, they're very, very ergonomically okay, they work, they're what the customer asked for. Message here is what the customer wants you do. I'm proud to say this did not take 30 years, it only took 20, okay? But the message number two is relentless product development in the interest of your customer needs and not what you think you can do or what you think your company can save on doing, okay? This is a tough lesson for us to learn and I'm serious about two decades. Item number three, and this was probably the most important one to me and most meaningful because it's also probably one of the largest changes we're making in BMW is Embrace the diversity that is in your client and customer base. Embrace the diversity that is in your community and of those whom you want to be in your family. You'll see with our campaign coming up uh, in the beginning of November, it's called The Road Home. And you'll see, I think, much better outreach, much better representation of the diversity who's already driving our cars. Not just the ultimate driving machine, but also the ultimate people who drive them. So I think, please keep an eye out for this. It's in the digital space. It'll be all over TV. The Road Home runs for all of November and all of December. Uh, and you'll see some other campaigns coming up, I think, where we're really trying to catch up with our competitors, mm -hmm. many of whom do a better job with diversity messaging and outreach than we have been doing. <coughs> and finally, the millennials. Those are the guys who cross shop you 100%. Okay? <laughs> Let's get to know them. They're not that... I was... Look, they're not that scary. <laughs> I was reading something the other day in probably WikiHow or something, and it says millennials, and the, is it da, da, are actually human beings, <laughs> okay? They're not to be feared. They're to be you know, interrogated, investigated, talk to them. You've got most, most, many of you have some of them running around the house. Call them. Text them. They love that, <laughs> okay? So message number four is let's get to know our millennials, okay? Just to conclude, right, to bring the customer experience together with the ultimate driving machine, four things, go digital and go big, relentlessly develop your products to meet the needs of the customer and not the needs of your company, embrace the diversity that's in your community and in your customer base, and let's get to know those millennials. My name is Craig Westbrook, I'm a VP with BMW of North America. I grew up six miles northeast of this stage it's a pleasure to be back in Atlanta and an honor to be a part of your conference. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. So a few things there. Millennials are people, too. And Craig, I don't know if no one needs a BMW. I know I do, so I will call you. <laughs> um, so now, Gwen, I'd like to turn it over to you. And, and let's peel back the onion on corporate sustainability. This has been a critical topic for multiple years, but it's not something that just corporations should embrace. So should our minority businesses. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, I think my, my brief talk really ties in Aether's and Craig's discussion really well. When you think about sustainability, oftentimes in the US, and I'm gonna stand up and do some roles to keep us awake, no, I'm kidding. Uh. I, sustainability at its fundamental core is about meeting the needs of today without compromising the future. And whether that future be one that is more just future, a future that may have equal access to capital, um, better integration of immigrants, whether it be around living within the planetary boundaries, which today, at the trajectory in 2030, we're gonna be living, needing a planet, we actually we'll need two and a half Earths, to meet consumption of today. So whatever it is that we do today, sustainability is about how do we manage through the social impacts whether it be through our subcontractors in ethical labor sourcing. Not talking about trafficking per se, labor trafficking. Ethical labor sourcing at its core is about how do you ensure fairness and access to labor supply as contractors or subs of a subs of a contractor. People should not be able or have to pay for access to documentation or access to applying for a job. That's ethical labor sourcing. But 
you know, most of this discussion is all about environmental sustainability, right? But what about economic sustainability? A lot of what Aether mentioned today was clearly around this area of what, what's now referred to as governance when we talk to investors. So how do I, you know, I still run a, a small operation of market research consulting out of the Pacific and then came to the Southwest. And at that time, I didn't use the term economic sustainability or governance. This is about 20 years ago. And I think about how did I differentiate myself from competitors who might have been political insiders to some of those who were running the, the territory at that time. But I differentiated myself to assuring that my data was secure and it was separate from their competitors. My data was market research on potential products. I also assured that I had no conflict of interest with the agency that I was uh, associated with. So their agencies were not concerned. I was also assuring them that whoever worked for us as newcomers to that market were getting a fair wages, access to jobs, but also even more competitive environments to work in where we cared for the employees and where we wanted to grow and develop and, ma and mature them into their, the workplace or have them as mature and seasoned managers in the workplace. This is all about governance and economic sustainability. So I think about differentiation. I mean, it took us three years as a non-brand in the Pacific and in the Southwest to really get into this level of trust. And I think trust is, is really shown through how we manage the governance of our business and how we manage social sustainability and access. But it's also about how we differentiate ourselves, right? As, as Craig and Aether mentioned, how do you differentiate and change as times are changing as well? And in the space around working with large companies, I differentiated myself in both Guam and, and Las Vegas as the president of the American Marketing Association in both areas. So I added value to those relationships where I said, hey, I could you know, essentially offer a network of other networks if you want to market and support your business. I didn't sell that, but the value add is all about how I became an expert in a space I didn't understand. I'm not a marketer. I'm a researcher, now I'm a sustainability person, diversity person, but it is about adding value, and I would highly recommend in this, this era of how companies are really trying to understand the implications beyond their boundaries of where they buy. It's literally two or three tiers away from their subs of a sub of a sub. These large companies are becoming more responsible and accountable for succession planning or for protecting the labor force or for growing and developing contractors. So I, I think the, the why around sustainability, or I refer to it as ESG, environmental, social, and governance. It helps you get more business. It helps your customers get more business. It is also a major talent attraction. I talk about Gen, uh, the millennials. I think also about my kids who are Gen Z, which are three and five year olds, which scare the hell out of me <laughs> about what, what will happen when they start getting into the workplace. And I think about the attraction. So when, we, when I talk to the millennials in our workplace, what we do around social and environmental sustainability, it's clearly, hands down, one of the reasons why they come to Caesars, right? why they move wherever they're at in the world to come and work for us. It's all about talent attraction, retention, and development. But at most, being a value add partner, a partner of choice, is clearly one of the, the major reasons why I would suggest learning more about the frameworks of the how. Sustainability has a lot of the hows. If you find me and LinkedIn me, um, I'm happy to share with you some of the resources and share with you some of the options to literally go through and use it as checklist to get into this, this space of better governance and better vendor relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. I think you left us with the perfect nugget, and that is business sustainability equals differentiation. So thank you. Craig, um, Aether, Gwen, thank you for sitting down with us to have this very important conversation. We could have dug into this for another hour. Maybe we'll come back for a part two in another NMSDC forum, but I think you left us with some great tools for our toolkit. Before we leave the stage, I want to thank NMSDC and the NMSDC team for another fabulous, phenomenal conference. So thank you. I continue to be inspired and energized by your commitment. 
to um, driving diverse business inclusion. <coughs> and as I think about it, next year will be the 30th year of Bank of America Supplier Diversity Program. So I'd like to announce that in the spirit of that and supporting you, um, we're going to introduce a $1 million scholarship fund for diverse businesses. Wow. Awesome. That's right. In 2020, our goal is to give away $1 million in capacity building scholarships. So if you want to learn more about that, come to our booth, 1335, bring us your business card, um, and here's to you. So let's thank our panelists for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.